Welcome Westside. It is so wonderful to have you guys out this morning, those of you who are in the sanctuary. Everyone joining us online, it's wonderful to have you online with us. Looking forward to you and the day that you're here with us in person in the sanctuary as well. Um, you know, Patrick, this morning uh, we had 66. It's, it's first of, the, of a two-week series back in the back. And, and as I was walking back there, you know, on, on the right side, there, there's that, the, the sketch artist of all the, the pastors in the past that have been at Westside, including PD. And I thought to myself, what a great testament of heroes of the faith. And then we sit out here and I'm looking at these faces and I think to myself, this is a generation, young or old, wherever they are, that are heroes of the faith, that one day people will talk about the great things that they've done for the Lord. And it just, it made me excited to be part of Westside. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what a great family church to be a part of. I love the history of our church. Um, and what a great thing that we did this morning having Dr. Ken Olney come yeah. and teach our, our Route 66 class. Uh, if you were there, could you just give him like a like a clap of like, thanks, like thanks for coming, yeah. thanks for being a part of that. If you If you weren't there this morning, He's gonna be back next week. We'd love for you to join us. Yeah, yeah. You, and he's, he's not plugging his book, so I'm going to, because it's a good book. Um, you can get it on Amazon. You can come and see me, and I'll figure out a way to get a copy to you. But 66 is a cool book. Some other cool things that are happening with Westside that, that is outside of the walls of this church itself is the Nazarene Missions has some different things going on. Currently, it's the School Pals Pack. And in the path, you can grab a Ziploc bag like this. It's got all these, I, I'm a type of guy. Now you've got it all together. I, I watch you, you have yeah, it all I, together. I have it all together, yeah. Jeff. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. My wife, if she doesn't say things like, turn the stove on before you put the water on the pan to make the macaroni and cheese, it'll never get made and it's macaroni and cheese. Our, our wives would get along well. Would they? Okay, yeah, they would get along all right, well. all right. So, so maybe you just carry it better than I do. But, but in here is the step-by-step -step instructions for even a guy like me to fill out the Nazarene Pal Pack mission. So grab one and, and take an opportunity to, to be the light of the world out into this world. Yeah, we wanna make an impact in our community. We don't just wanna be a church for ourselves, but we wanna be for our community, for Indy. It's one of our things that we really uh, are, are core to who we are here at Westside. Um, Jeff, did you know that next week is a pretty big week? It's a pretty big Sunday. So if, if, you're, if you're not picking up what I'm, what I'm saying with that, next week is Mother's Day. Oh, Mother's Day. I thought you meant because the Indy, I think, has a Grand Prix going. No, no, no. no this no, is no. bigger than the Grand Prix. Bigger this is than the bigger. bigger. Yeah. Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day. So guys, kids, if you haven't gone to the store and gotten your mother a card or a gift, this is your warning. I'm warning you right now. I actually, my, my gift came in the mail this week. I was pretty proud of myself. I'm on top of it this year, but I haven't been in the past. Yeah. So uh, this is my reminder to you, but also it's a great week to come out to church. We have some special things going on here. So bring your moms, we're gonna honor them. We're gonna have a little gift. It's gonna be a great day. So make sure you're here next week for Mother's Day as we celebrate moms and all the great things they do. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think about, you know, as, as a dad, um, of, especially dad of grown children, I think I did okay. But then when I sit back and I really think about it, I'm like, those kids were doomed if it wasn't <laughs> for their mom, right? Yeah. And, and so we, we should have Mother's Day every Sunday, but, but especially this coming Sunday. 100%, 100%. Yeah. Tell yeah. us about Say Yes to Jesus. Yeah, so Say Yes to Jesus, um, 
a lot of things are happening in that. We're seeing story after story. We're going to hear a story later in the service today about that. My challenge is to everyone that can hear my voice, what is your say yes to Jesus? Jesus is in the Bible, throughout the Bible, calling on us, begging us to live out that Christian life. Um, and, and, and to share the gospel. How are we gonna share the gospel? Inside the walls of this church, how are we gonna serve? How are we gonna say yes to Jesus? Outside the walls of this church, how are we gonna say yes to Jesus? If you see a need in the community and you wanna do something about it, we wanna empower you to do it. So write an application to the Say Yes to Jesus Fund. Yep. And I wanna highlight uh, tonight over at Indy First Church, Pastor Kayla is getting ordained. <laughs> So if you're free tonight at 5 p.m. over at Indy First Church on the east side of town, come on out and support Pastor Kayla. We would love for you to come and be a part of that. It's going to be a really special time. I will be there. I'll be in a suit of Ooh. all things. Yeah, so uh, that, if, that, if Pastor Kayla is not enough reason, I'll be in a suit. So that, that's, <laughs> that's all I got for you. Hey, would you guys do me a favor? Would you stand with us as we prepare for worship? Aaron's not here, and we're joined today by Zach. He's our guest worship leader. So sing loud, sing proud for him this morning and make him feel welcomed today. Father, we are your children. Spirit, this is your church. Jesus, you are our savior and king and the church of God said. Breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high with 
I search the world But it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together is now satisfied here in your love let's sing this together oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better No, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of
live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you sing holy holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and You may be seated. 
Today is the first Sunday of the month, and uh, this has become a designated time when we explore our Say Yes to Jesus campaign, and it has picked up so much momentum for which I'm excited about, and over these next months, you're going to hear about various ones who are saying yes to Jesus. One of those individuals today is Marveen. Marveen had emailed me and said, I have this idea, and I loved it. And I just love how God talks to us and in creative ways. And I want you to share about that, if you would. Okay, I have to be honest. When Pastor Dave first talked to me about the Say Yes to Jesus concept back in November, I was feeling just a little bit overwhelmed with all the different things I was doing. And I thought it was a good concept, but I immediately came to my mind where the phrase is, I'm already saying yes to Jesus every day. I'm doing enough. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we know how that goes, right? So then come February, the Church of the Nazarene in general has grant money that they were going to give to local churches, but in order to qualify for that grant money, you had to select three people from your church, a minimum of three, that would attend two Saturday training sessions. This program is called WITH, W-I-T-H, in capital letters. Before I went, I had no idea what it meant, but it basically meant to qualify for the grant money, you had to do something with your local community, not for your local community, but something that you did with your local community. Uh Some of the churches had their programs in mind and they were doing big things as a church. Pastor Dave asked if we could use our Say Yes to Jesus program which is empowering individuals to say yes to Jesus Mm -hmm. and letting the church fund it. And they said, yes, we could. But I came away from those training sessions thinking, so what does this mean for us? And I kept having the us in there and not the me. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) And I kept thinking about all the things I'm not qualified to do. I'm not going to go out and fix someone's house that needs repairs. You know, there are things I can't do. But as I thought about it, Chapel Glen Elementary School, which is right across the street from the church, is probably our closest neighbor other than Holmes. And for years, we had a relationship with Chapel Glen. Debbie Zolman and Kathy Spaulding led a Wiz Kids tutoring program. And then, of course, the pandemic came, and we had no kids in the church from Chapel Glen. They are both now full-time caretakers with their uh, spouses. But it kept coming back to me. My life is so full, I thought, there's no way I can start a tutoring program, and we don't have space for it. So I was talking about it with a group of women one night. One of those women was our pastor's wife, Erica Thornhill. And she looked at me, and she said, why don't you just love on on the teachers? Hmm. And I thought, well, that is something I can do with the help from a few friends. So on May 30th, which is the last day of school for the teachers and staff, no students will be there. A group of us, some of us women, are going to go and have a brunch lunch, is what the principal called it. So that's what she asked for when I contacted her. It's their last day of school, and they will be talking about the things that went well this year, the things that didn't go so well, starting from plan- planning for next year. And um, when I called, I couldn't get through, so I left a message. It was three days before she called me back. Mm -hmm. And she made the comment that that morning that you called and left the message, she was having a very, very bad day. She was in an emergency meeting in a crisis situation with a student. And she said, when I finally came back to the office and I listened to my voicemail, she said, I cried. (laughs) Because I asked, what could we do to support your teachers? Awesome. And so we are going to be giving them small appreciation gifts. And we're also going to pass out a bookmark that will have a blessing for educators on one side and the church's name, telephone number, and logo on the other side. So my prayer for this is that maybe there's someone in that group of staff and teachers that needs to know there's a church that cares. Sure. And so I don't know what's next for this, but that's where we're starting. That is awesome. Marvin. thank you so very much for that. Ushers. I want you to come down, and while you're coming down to the front, 
I just want to say, do you feel the momentum, the intensifying of this say yes to Jesus? It's more than a campaign. You've heard me say that before. This is a culture that is permeating who we are. And I love that idea so very much. I hope it will cause you to be thinking, what is it that God wants me to do? And we're going to have a wonderful year of just saying yes to Jesus. And uh, on this first Sunday of the month, we pass the offering plates, and it's such a beautiful moment of worship. Let's pray for a moment. Father, bless this offering. Those that give online, those that will give something in the offering bucket today, we just worship you through this amazing privilege that we have to give back to you. In Christ's name, amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me and I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, and the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Let's all stand together as we continue to worship. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. Then all
Remain standing. Let's pray together. Father, there is such a beautiful tone of praise and worship that is happening in this sanctuary today. And we just exalt you and magnify your name. You are worthy of our praise. Father, in the midst of all the jubilance that we sense and feel, it could be the loneliest place for someone because of what they are struggling with or dealing with in their own lives personally. And so this morning we pause to just pray for whatever the need might be for those that are here in the sanctuary that are watching online. Jesus, come near and may there be that sense of your presence that would be felt today. Sometimes, dear Jesus, it seems we get so busy with just the routine, just the mundane stuff of life, that we fail to take time to hear your voice in the way that we should. Because we so many times realize later how you were at work in our lives in moments when we weren't even aware but Jesus, this morning, help us to not be so busy, but to really focus on you. And especially in this moment, as Pastor Dave comes to bring the message, may we clear our minds of all the other stuff. Help us not to be distracted with any of the things that the enemy would try to just inject into our minds. But that we will focus on you and the Word of God that is being presented. May Pastor Dave feel and sense that tug of the Holy Spirit in a powerful way as he delivers the message. We're just trusting you that your will will be accomplished in this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now... As we be seated here, I am asking that all the kids go to my left, meet Kayla and the security team, and uh, they will uh, take you to Children's Church. All right, all right, all right. Good morning. Good to be with you. Good to be with you today. I want to remind you, you heard earlier, but if you came in after the Takeaway 5 tonight at 5 o'clock, Pastor Kayla, our children's pastor, will be ordained. It's a big thing in the life of a pastor. 5 o'clock tonight at Indianapolis First Church on the other side of the city. We'd invite all of you to attend if you're able to and interested. Special night to celebrate what God's doing in her life and ministry. So just want to make sure you knew that was going on and to encourage you to be there. All right, today. We, so we've been in the book of Genesis for a few weeks here. We're going to be in it for some time. We're not there yet. Yeah. Um, we're going to be in it for some time looking at the book of Genesis and studying all that God has for us. Um, and our idea right now in Genesis is we're looking at the very beginning, how everything kind of went bad, bad, bad. And later on, after Genesis, we're going to look at Revelation and look how God made everything all right, all right, all right. Okay? So that's where we're going this year. We've been in Genesis for a few weeks and that we're going to continue to be on. Today we're going to be in chapters, if you got it, your Bible, 10 and 11. Story of the Babylon Tower, the Tower of Babylon, Tower of Babel. We're going to talk about that today, chapters 10 and 11. Now, as you know, every week I have my texting screen over here. And you can text me any question you have about the, uh, about the, uh, the text that we're looking at today. Or even really anything that's led up to this. And we'll... Try to answer the questions during the sermon or maybe pause and answer them right there. Honestly, hey, I have no idea if you have any questions about this one or not. I knew you would have questions about Noah, sure, and Cain and Abel and the creation. I knew we would have those questions, absolutely. I have no idea if you have any questions about the Tower of Babel. So 
I'm, I'm curious to know what you might ask today. So you can ask anything at all today. My phone number's on the screen. It'll be on the corner of the screens as well. It'll show up here, and we'll try to address those as we go along. If any even come up, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that one today. But in keeping with our theme, and I, can't, I think this is the last week for it. A couple weeks ago, we did, with Adam and Eve, name that famous couple. And with their sons, we said, name those favorite brothers. And with Noah's Ark, we did, name that famous boat. How about today we do, name that famous building. I don't think I can keep this up any more weeks. So this, this has some fun here. So I'll just put some buildings on the screen here. And uh, you can call it out loud if you want to. If you know what it is, we'll see. Now, we're going to get some of these easy, some of these more difficult. What do we got here? Eiffel Tower. Yes, I scoured Facebook. Some of you might be in some of these. <laughs> Facebook, that's like... I have, I have license to use these in any way, right? Okay, sure. All right. So, uh, awesome right there. Next one we got? Empire State Building right there. I have kissed Erica right there. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. All right, all right, all right. All right. Next one. What we got? Anybody been there? Space Needle. There you go. Next we got? St. Louis Arch. It's not a building, but it's a big monument. Anybody been to the top of that thing? You know, you go up with that little egg capsule, any claustrophobics, you freak out on that thing, right? What do we got here? Big Ben, Big Ben. What do we got here? <laughs> leaning, leaning Tower of Dave Gruber. <laughs> Dave, awesome, right there. <laughs> awesome, I'll just, I'll just leave that there. I'm going to make that my phone screensaver. All right, next. What do we got here? The pyramids. What do we have here? Yeah, when we moved to Indianapolis, people told us about the, the drive up by the pyramids. I'm like, we have pyramids? Like, and we saw that when we went, yeah, this is weird. <laughs> Three buildings called the pyramids. What do we have here? The Tower of Terror. The Tower of Terror. Macy Lingo is so awesome right there. That's cute as can be. But the Tower of Terror right there. What do we got here? The Burj Khalifa. This is, that's how you build a building. Holy moly. They got all the money, though. They got the oil and the money. They can build that, right? There you go. Burj Khalifa, what do we have here? Is it the Willis Tower or the Sears Tower? All right, some of you know. And you've been up here where they have the little, the little things that push out. I've been there. Uh, absolutely, right? Yeah. What do, you, what do we have here? Anybody know what that one is? If you know what this is, I'm going to be impressed. The Nakatomi Tower. Anybody seen Die Hard? It's the one that burned and die hard. And lastly, Tower of Babel. Let's talk about this story. Great story here, okay? I don't, again, I'm not sure we have any text, but shoot them in quickly, okay? Now, before we get into the text of chapters 10 and 11, I want to give you three background verses that we've already looked at in previous chapters that drive some of the information today and, like, set the story up. So let me show you what those are. Okay, first one, this happens in two different verses. Where God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, as you know, in the first, what, nine chapters of Genesis, we really have two creation stories and two fall stories. The story of Adam and Eve and Noah, both, okay? This is Adam and Eve in 128. God tells them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. He repeats that in Genesis 9 when, Adam, when Noah and his family come off the ark, his three sons. And he tells them the exact same command, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, Okay. God gave this command twice. It's important, and it still stands. I believe I don't have time to really, really go into this, but I do believe this command still stands for all Christians, that it's not just about making babies, it's about making disciples. And this is God's command. I don't think God's ever taken this away. There are instances in the Bible, like with Jesus and Paul and a few guys who don't have wives and children, it's because they're on mission for God. And sometimes God calls somebody to Grand global missions, it's rare in which God says, you're going to do something different to make disciples, but in normal life, Christians are to make babies. And that doesn't mean like, uh, now some people can't because of, you know, health issues. That's, I'm not counting all that in. That's, that's different, of course. But if uh, all things being considered, this is God's command for all of us. Now, according to what we've read, and you'll see it here, they did great at the first half of this command. Have you noticed that? The first half of this command, be fruitful and multiply. They enjoyed that. They did that. They did that quite a bit. There was lots of people on the planet. Some scholars even say at the time of Noah, it could be up to a billion people on the planet. We don't know for sure. A lot of people, they're doing that. But they didn't do a good job at the second half. Now, there are actually other verses in the Bible that have these two kind of, like, this commands that have two things going on in them. And we like the first half 
but not the second half. Like we liked the first half of this in Genesis, but we didn't like the second half. There are other verses. We'll see it next week with Abraham. And God says, I will bless you and make you a blessing. And we like the first half. I will bless you. We love to be blessed. Don't you love to be blessed by God? That's good. But sometimes we forget the second half so you can also be a blessing to all people. We, we don't do so good at that all the time. Or in uh, Corinthians it says, um, everything is permissible, but not everything's, you know, beneficial. We like the first half. Everything's permissible. Yay! Yeah, but not everything's beneficial. We don't really like that one. We do this at times. They're doing that with this command right here. They weren't spreading. They were clustering. Interestingly enough, the exact same thing happens with Jesus and the apostles. Jesus, you know, uh, dies, resurrects. He's going to heaven. He's going to be ascended into heaven, and he tells the disciples, go into all the earth. Making disciples. Just, I mean, spread this thing. People are everywhere now. Spread it as far as you can go. For eight years, they really didn't go anywhere. They stayed really near Jerusalem. They hung out right there for a variety of reasons. And so God's like, ah, what are we going to, we're going to solve this problem. How does God solve that problem? Ultimately, he calls another guy, Paul. Paul the apostle, who tells, the way I like to say it is, they're not reaching the world, and Jesus says, I need to call another guy, I need an alpha, I need a guy who will do, actually do this, and he calls Paul, and Paul says to the disciples, you guys get Jerusalem? I got the rest of the world, and that's where he really does that, and it spreads like wildfire, okay? How does God fix the problem with the Genesis people that are clustering, and they're not leaving, they're not spreading, they're not filling the earth? He's going to confuse their languages. That's, so you see, when that happens, you know, it's because God has this command from the very beginning of time. Now, that's one pre, pre-verse. Here's another pre-verse. This is from Genesis 6, 11. I didn't really share this with you last week. God had us kind of wait to this week to do it. Talk about the, what the world was like when God flooded it, before God flooded it. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of Hamas. Okay, your version probably says the word violence there for Hamas. Let's, let's just kind of circle that word and uh, put a pen in it. Hamas, okay? You've heard this word, right? Heard it on the news. You've heard it on social media. Hamas means violence. This verse, this era is exactly where Hamas gets their name, okay? They've chosen it intentionally. It means violence. That's what it means, okay? I know this is like... Touching some third rails in some ways. With, here's, so what's going on? In, in this world of violence, in a Hamas, God floods them. God, God destroys them. God recreates. And it's not that God expected that this wouldn't come about again. He, he's God. He knows all things. And then after Noah, as people are growing, you'll see that Hamas returns. Violence returns, okay? Kind of God's answer to this, just so you help, to help you see what's going on this global global conflict that we continue to see between Israel and Hamas is not something new. It's been going on since the beginning of all this. It's been going on these two things. In a world full of Hamas and violence and far from, far from God, God will create a nation, as you'll see today, a nation, Israel, that is to be holy. We got Hamas and holy. These are the two things that are in constant conflict, and they will be in constant conflict. I'll share you some more about that in just a little bit, and you'll see and understand why as we go through the book, or the, I'm sorry, the story of the Tower of Babel. This is why uh, in college campuses, this clash, it's not a new thing, it's a constant thing that the spirit of Hamas is always after the God's spirit of holiness, as we'll talk about, okay? Now, a third concept to have in your back of your brain before we go forward is this verse from Genesis 9. Let me get rid of my, uh, my, my deal here, right? Okay, all right. So, this is after Noah lands the ark, they all come out, they're growing the world, and Noah sins. Noah gets drunk, and he sins. And this is the words. Cursed be Canaan, that's the son of Ham. The lowest of slaves will be, he will be to his brothers. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. Remember, Noah has three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. These three guys and their wives are on the ark, and God says, we're going to repopulate the world with you three guys. After they land, Noah plants a vineyard. He drinks of the, the wine. He gets drunk, and he's naked in the tent. It's, just all, it's all going bad for him. We don't know the particulars, but somehow Ham, his son Ham, sees him naked. 
and shamed. It's a reiteration of what's going on in the first, you know, uh, first creation story with Adam and Eve, that they're naked and without shame, then they are shamed in their nakedness. He's shaming his father some way. He goes, tells his brothers. And somehow, this is, it's, it's, he's shaming his dad, but his brothers, Japheth and Shem, refuse to look at their father. They actually walk in backwards with a blanket and they drop it over their dad. Noah wakes up and this is what he says. He curses the son of Japheth, okay? The family line. He singles out Canaan. And he also singles out Shem's line. And Shem will be particularly blessed. The son Shem will be particularly blessed. Ham's family will be particularly cursed. Out of Shem's line will come Abraham and then all they'll be down. Eventually the Messiah will come from this land, okay? So just keep all that in mind as we move forward because it all factors into knowing what's going on in chapter 10 and 11. Now, we're not going to read much of chapter 10, a few things, but then 11 is where we'll really spend some time here. So, but I do want to look at the first verse of chapter 10. This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's son who themselves had sons after the flood. Okay, these are our three guys. Shem, Ham, Japheth. You are related to one of those guys. In heaven, you'll find out who. We are all thinking, I hope not Ham, hope not Ham, hope not Ham. <laughs> all right, and in and, and chapter 10, it's called the Table of Nations, okay? Now, to make sure you know this, chapter 10 is all these nations that God creates, Chapter 11 is how it happens. So they're almost out of chronological order, okay? Just so you see what's happening there, okay? Out of Japheth, okay? Japheth, I think he's the oldest, right? Comes 14 nations. And you can read about them in the chapter. And on and on through history, you know, the Greeks come from them, the Romans, the Europeans, the Russians, um, Germany, Hitler's a part of this, we think. You know, that this, this is who they are, okay? Out of Shem will come 26 nations. They're listed. They're the Semites. The Japheth are the Japhethites. The Shem are the Semites. Keep that word in mind. Israel will come out of them, as well as other nations, but Israel predominantly, okay? Out of Ham, the Hamites, that's a weird, <laughs> I'm a Hamite, right? Um, that, there are 30 nations will come out of them, including some of the bad guys. All hit, the, some of the dastardly guys of history, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, Iraqis, Nineveh, the Philistines, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, Amorites the Gigersites, the Canaanites, the Electrolytes, and the Cellulites. And they all come out. <laughs> all right, just make sure you're with me. They all come out of this guy, right? Which is the enemies of Israel, which is interesting as you read the chapter. Remember, Moses is writing this to the Israelites. They've just been freed from some of the bad guys of these guys, the Egyptians. And, and Moses is like, I need to write down our story so they all know the God we're serving. We kind of have this all together. And they're, all the Israelites are reading this and going, oh, so that's, that's where they, this is, they're connected to the dots between all these guys. And when they get in the promised land, they know who they're going to have to fight. That's what's going on. Now, the nations from these three will constantly be in conflict, and it still is happening today. What you see today on college campuses in, in, in the Middle East, and, and, and it's always been the case. It's always been the case for years and years, thousands of years, actually for millennia. Um, animosity and hatred for Shem and his family, the Semites, that's where we get the word anti-Semite, okay? It comes from Shem. One of Noah's three sons, okay? That's where it all comes from, and uh, so those, those are the three guys, okay? Now, chapter 10 is, I don't know if you read it this week. I'm hoping you're reading this every week. <laughs> chapter 10 is like reading a Hebrew phone book. There's 70 names in there, and it's like brutal to pronounce some of these things, right? It, it's hard to get them out, so I don't know if you read it or not. It should be sponsored by Ancestry.com, and it's one of those genealogy books. It's all this family tree. We're going to only look at one name. We'll do that in a minute. But I do want to give you a couple principles from chapter 10 that are the overarching theme if you want to study that this week and kind of understand what is, what is happening in a genealogy in the Bible. Why should we even care? Okay? Number one, I want you to know this. God knows your name and he loves you. God, God knew all these names. Can you imagine Nothing, well, we don't know if anything was written down, maybe a few things, I don't know. But when Moses writes this, either he's got all this in memory or, or God has given him the names or somehow he has all these names from thousands of years, 1,400 years before him, and he writes them down, God knows your name and he loves you. Now, admittedly, if you read chapter 10, it's a bit of a boring read. Some of you are reading like through the Bible through in a year. Some of you have done that. Some of you are doing it right now. 
And multiple times in the Bible, when you get to genealogy, you're like, oh, this is brutal. I, I got to read this. And you're like, what did I get? I don't know what I got out of this, right? Here's one thing. In Genesis, we have these lists of names. Now, again, later on, we're going to Revelation. Revelation talks about another book with a list of names, and it's the book of life. I promise you, when you stand before God, that will not be a boring read. You're going to be very, very attentive. I hope it's not alphabetical because I'm thorny. I'm way at the end. I don't know how that works. It's going to take like 150 years to get my name. I don't know how that works. Anyway, but we'll be excited about that. Uh, in Genesis, we have names, but just make sure your name is in the book of life. Jesus loves you, and he knows your name, and he wants you to be in the family tree of Jesus. Amen, church? Just know that. Secondly, what's going on here in this chapter, if you notice the theme of blessings and curses, it's in chapter 10. Actually, it's all through the book of Genesis. About 80 times God is blessing someone or cursing someone or things. We've already seen it. God uh, blessed the day. He blessed Sunday in creation, that this day is blessed. He blessed um, Adam and Eve and people. He cursed the ground at one point. He cursed Cain at one point. Ham and his family line are cursed here. Noah's family is blessed. There's this theme of blessing and cursing that goes on all throughout Scripture. And you know, all throughout Scripture, or especially in Genesis, some families, like Ham's family, are just cursed. And it's generational just forever, and it still goes on today. And some families are blessed. And for the Semites, it's just going on today. And God does that. Have you noticed, true in our world and our life too, that it seems like some people are just blessed and some people are just cursed? I don't know the theology behind all that. I don't, I don't pretend to know God's mind in all that. But I would say one thing we're learning in Scripture, we learn from Noah, God can bless who he wants, however he wants, but the typical pattern is when somebody, when a family is obedient to God, they're more likely to experience the blessings of God. So I don't know how you feel about your family. If you feel like your family line is blessed or cursed, I mean, I, I don't know. I can't make any claims about all that. But I can make the claim, the more obedient we are to Christ, the more he tends to put his blessing and his favor in our life. Blessings and curses. Another one here is 193 nations. That's how many there are today. Now, in the G- book of Genesis, chapter 10, we're looking at today, there are 70 nations, but there are 140, 193 identified by the UN today. You see my globe here, they're all over the place, Canada, North Korea, China, India, you know, Saudi Arabia, Madagascar, they're, they're all over the place, right? Romans 13 reminds us that every one of these governments, every one of them, they're all different. There's empires, there's kingdoms, there's democracies, there's republics, there's whatever, you know, there's stuff we don't even know about, right? Every single one of them has been put in place by God and has derivative authority. God is the only person ever who has innate authority. He just, he just has authority. He does. And he gives it to nations and rulers and leaders of these nations in derivative authority. He's der- they've given some authority. In other words, it's borrowed from God. It's on loan from God. And governments have been given authority and should use it rightly. They should use it rightly. Some governments have absolutely abused their authority. You know many of them. It's because they've been led by sinners, right? You've got Stalin, Hitler, Saddam, Hussein, Nero, and then you can go on and on. Nebuchadnezzar, there's so many, right? And leaders are to use their authority in ways to lead and honor God in his law, which you're going to see a leader in a minute not do that. And this includes governments. Do they make mistakes? Absolutely. All the time governments make mistakes because they're Imperfect people, right? Absolutely. The answer is not to get rid of government and anarchy, as Romans would tell us, but to improve it. To rebel against authority is to rebel against God. To rebel against any authority that God has put in your life, even if you're struggling with it, is to rebel against God. If you disobey your parents, you're rebelling against God. If you disobey your boss, you're rebelling against God. If you disobey your coach or your government, you're rebelling against God. Now, we're not talking about civil disobedience. That's a whole other topic here. We're just talking about in general, right? Your response to human authority that you can see is a reflection of your response to God's authority, whom you cannot see. That's what Romans tells us. But I remind us all this. The God who rules and reigns over all these governments someday is going to judge all these governments, all these people. Amen? So 193 governments, 193 nations is what has transpired. Another thing, just so you know, with all these, you know what the Bible tells us? That God has chosen your nation in your time. It is not random. 
It is not happenstance. I'll show you this because in the book of Acts it says this. Acts 17, that God made from one man, that is Noah. So we're all related to Noah because he had the three sons, right? Every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth and having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwellings. So God has determined how every nation is going to, where they're going to be, how long they're going to be, and who's going to live in them. And I don't pretend to know all of that, but I just believe for every one of us, God has us right here, right now, because we can make the maximum impact for Jesus in our life. Amen? Make sure you're a part of that work in your life. Now, one other point from chapter 10, and we'll get into some stories today because this matters, is God does not want one world nation. God doesn't want this. God is not a globalist. God is a nationalist. He wanted us to spread from the beginning, as we read earlier. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And he reiterates that again with the apostles. This is to spread the world, okay? There have been many attempts, some formal, some quasi-formal, to have one world governments. The, the UN maybe is reflective of that. The League of Nations, the one world government, the Third Reich was about that. The world federalist, the new world order. Did you know Einstein actually was a proponent of one world government. And recently, Elon Musk came out and said, this is a ridiculous idea. We should never do this. You know, so this is a constant conversation. God doesn't want us, as you'll see, he does not want us to become one global nation because it protects Christians. If we combine as one world nation, we're so sinful and so evil. Do you know what will reign? Hamas. Violence, sin, it happened before Noah, it happens after Noah, and to have a, uh, a global monolithic anti-Christian state would simply have the power to wipe out Christians everywhere. Actually, the book of Revelation says that in the end times, there will be a forming of one world government in which Christians will pay, face all kinds of persecution because of it. Now, we think that diversity of languages makes it hard for evangelism on a global level. And God thinks the exact opposite. It makes it so much easier from God's perspective. He sees it that way. God is more concerned about the dangers of human uniformity than human diversity. God loves that diversity. He absolutely does from what we're reading. We humans are just too evil to be allowed to unite in one language or one government. The gospel spreads better because there are 7,000 languages on the planet this day that we know of. God loves every nation equally, and he set them uh, in, in motion very intentionally. The reason he's done that is because if we get one person in charge of the whole world, it'll go bad for Christians. That's called the Antichrist. We'll get there when we get to Revelation. So there's some stuff about chapter 10. Now, let me look and see what text we got so we can include these in our stuff today. How long did the Tower of Babel take to build? Okay, we'll look at that when we get in the story. Did People remember God at all during the time of the Tower of Babel. So, uh, yeah, when we get to eastward, the concept of going east, we'll talk about that. How many years has passed from the flood to the tower? Ooh, I don't know. But if you want to geek out on that, chapter 10 actually tells you how long people were living. Chapter 11 as well, how many years they lived, and you can calculate that out. Actually, don't know the number. Somebody look it up and text it in. We'll put it on the screen. All right. Um, is that where the term babbling comes from? Yes. When somebody's babbling or a baby's babbling, you're going to get the concept. We'll talk about that in a minute. Why is Nimrod not mentioned in verse 7 as a son of Cush? I'll talk about Nimrod in a second. The curse of Ham has been used in the past to justify slavery and other atrocities. Are we still to hold animosity toward modern nations descended from Ham? I don't know that we're to hold animosity. That doesn't seem like a Christian thing that we want us to do. But this global conflict between Ham's people and God's people, the Hamas and the holy people, the Semites and the anti-Semites has always been the case. And Scripture says it will always be the case. Not because we desire it to be, but because God knows the future and God has revealed the future. And we need to uh, be a part of God's redemptive activity for sure, but just also aware that that conflict is ever present. And last one, why does it say one nation under God? I'm not sure. <laughs> because we are not one nation under God, but we were born as a Christian nation, sort of. We debate a lot about that. Um, some nations claim to be of the spirit of God. Some claim, nations claim to be of the spirit of Babylon. So I'll come back to that. Keep text coming in. I'm going to fold those into the sermon as we go. Now, let's look at one guy from chapter 10. Here he is. 
Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first sinners of his kingdom were Babylon, Ur, Akkad, and he goes on to some names here, okay? So it's a great city. So let's talk about what's happening here. Let's talk about this guy, Nimrod. There's lots of names in chapter 7, but Nimrod's the guy we want to talk about. Now, there are lots of good Bible names to name your children. There's Jonathan, David, Rebecca, Josh, there's some good ones. Don't name your kid Nimrod. <laughs> or in Acts chapter was eight, Dorcas. Don't, those two don't work. If you have twin boy and girl, it's Nimrod and Dorcas. That's just your terrible parent. <laughs> All right, don't do that. All right, so Nimrod, there he is. Now, let me explain this, why that happens. Nimrod is known as a mighty warrior. As a matter of fact, no, Moses writes, that it's why it is said, like Nimrod. So there was this colloquialism that even Moses knew that Nimrod is a mighty hunter. So Nimrod was like a, a hunter guy. Actually, do you know when that changed? I did not know this to this week, and please don't let this be the only thing you know today. But it's really cool. that The word Nimrod has always been associated with the mighty warrior until about 30, 40 years ago, something like that. Bugs Bunny cartoon. This really happened. Bugs Bunny cartoon, Daffy Duck is being hunted by Elmer Fudd, the mighty hunter. And he calls him a Nimrod. And that's when officially the word Nimrod became to identify with somebody who's kind of a bumbling idiot. Did you know that? Now, don't let that be. Let's talk about the small groups tonight. Jesus told me. About, but no, no. It's just fascinating to talk about that. Anyways, there it is. Josephus, one of the first century church historians, wrote about Nimrod. Now, we are thousands of years removed from this. And just like Moses, there's, there's quotes about him. There's stuff that they knew about him. Even in the first century, they, could, they knew stuff about these guys that we've lost in antiquity or we just don't know. But Josephus wrote two things about him, that Nimrod wanted to build a tower tall enough so that it couldn't be flooded again. That was kind of his motivation. We want to get this up high enough so if God ever comes back to flood us again, which God said he wouldn't do, so he's not reading the Bible, or he's not knowing the stories, right? Um, he, he, we wouldn't be flooded again. And secondly, Nimrod had made a claim, according to Josephus, that he would take revenge on God for destroying their ancestors. Now, that's history. We don't have that in the Bible, but it's interesting a lot. Now, also, he's the first ruler of Babylon. Very important to what we're talking about today. Babel... Um, in Babylonian language, means gateway to God. Very prideful gateway to God. Not Yahweh, not Elohim, but God in general, right? In Hebrew, it means confusion. So there's always this debate. If you're from Babylon in that day, they would say, we are the gateway to God. And Hebrews would say, no, you're just plain confused. Doesn't that sound like a lot of ideologies today? That the spirit of Babylon infiltrates so many ideologies today. We see it all the time in our world. It's always been the case. Where they claim, we know the secrets of God. We are woke. We have the ideas. We know about God. And Christianity is like, no, you are just babbling. just making stuff up. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. It happens there. Babylon is in modern day Iraq. If you ever heard of the Code of Hammurabi? It comes out of Babylon in around year 16 or 1750 or so, right around there. They... In this day, they become a superpower. They continue to be a superpower for a long time. In the book of Daniel, they are the big deal. We went that two years ago, I believe it was, in the the book of Daniel, okay? They are throughout the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. They are the epitome. They are the symbol of Satan's counterfeit kingdom. Now, there are two kingdoms in the Bible kind of, histor- you know, happening here. God's authentic kingdom, God who has the only kingdom, who is the only authority, and Satan's counterfeit kingdom. Satan's rebelling, trying to build a counterfeit kingdom. Because whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. He does. Like, God says, you must be born again. Satan's counterfeit is, you must be woke. You must have all these great ideas. You must have the gateway to heaven. You must have new thoughts, new ideas, new things, Right? That, that's that's what, what happens. God creates conviction to bring us closer to him. Satan creates condemnation to push us farther from him. He's always counterfeiting what God does. God's authentic kingdom has pastors and missionaries and, and elders and, you know, this sort of thing. And Satan's counterfeit kingdom has false prophets and false teachers and false ideas. You know, like Nimrod here. Revelation 
is going to call Babylon the mother of all prostitutes, while Jesus calls the church his bride. You see this constant fighting here. Even in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, God creates Eden, this great garden. Many years later in Babylon, the, the king will build the Babylonian garden, this false counterfeit Eden. It's all throughout Scripture. I could go on and on and on. Paul, or Peter, when he opens with the book First Peter, he says, I'm writing to you from Rome. What does he call Rome? The great Babylon. He even calls it that. It was an ancient city, but the spirit behind Babylon is alive and well today. You need to know that. We don't want it to be, but it is. That's why we said, somebody said here, what should we do about the conflict? It's just there. We need to be in the fight for God's way and God's plan. There's always a conflict between the kingdom of God and a spirit that is trying to create a counterfeit kingdom. This counterfeit kingdom is trying to overtake every single aspect of life. Sexuality, politics, morality, philosophy, education, parenting, gender, it's everywhere, right? This counterfeit kingdom is seeking to make everything antithetical and opposed to the kingdom of God. It just is. That's the fight that we're in. It wants all of you it wants all of you. It wants your marriage. It wants your kids. It wants your mindset. It wants everything of you. That's the fight that we're in. The spirit of Babylon is alive and well today. And we learn in 2 Thessalonians and Revelation, when we get there, you'll see, we'll just, this will be a theme that's going to continue to come around, that in the last days, the Antichrist will do mighty works in one world kind of government vibe in a metaphorical Babylonian type environment. This is a constant all throughout Scripture. In the Bible, God creates Israel through Shem. Satan counterfeits this holy nation through Ham's line in Hamas. That's the fight that's going on, and it started right here, and it continues on today. Now, let me, show, let me also add to what's going on, layer on to what's going on today, right? So in Israel, you've got, or I'm sorry, in Babylon, you've got this city of Babylon that they want to make this great tower up to God and be, you know, we'll, we're going to look at that in just a second. But God then creates in Israel another city, Jerusalem. It's a, almost a tale of two cities in the Bible, Babylon and Jerusalem. Babylon who wants to create a great tower to glorify themselves and God levels it low and God creates Jerusalem, which is called a city on a hill, right? It's this, again, this metaphor, this fight. And this is why it's a constant fight against Israel. This is why people are anti-Israel. It's because the spirit of Hamas and Babylon is constantly coming after God's people. It's this supernatural spiritual warfare that you got to know is actually happening. So when you see that on campuses, when you see that in the news, when you see rockets flying, it's all from this, that God makes them low and he puts his name high, but they want their name, their false God to be named high. That's the battle that, that we are in. It's the heartbeat of all things. Now, this is why we support Israel. Now, to be clear, we don't support the sin of Israel. Israel is very much not living a holy in, in, you know, reality these days. They're far from God. Atheism is prevalent. They are not that. So we're not supporting that. What we're supporting is God's plan to redeem them, and a remnant will come out of them, and God will use them, and it's, it's where God is glorified. That's what we are supporting. It's a very complicated thing for all of us to even understand. Now, with that in mind, let's look at the story of the Tower of Babylon, and I think this is a really fun story to look at. So let's look at it right here, okay? So now, the whole world had one language, this is chapter 11, and one common speech. This was before the Noah's boys had kids and it spreads, right, in chapter 10. Now, we have no idea what the original language was uh, of them. We don't know what this original language was. It was asked a couple weeks ago, what was the original language? Nobody asked it today, but it was asked a couple weeks ago. I told you the story, I'll recap. 1740 to 1786, King Frederick over France had the baby experiment. I told you this, but it's still fascinating if you haven't heard it. They got 50 babies, and he told the nurses, we're going to raise them. You can feed them, you can touch them, but you can't ever talk to them. Because we want to know, as they grow, what language will they automatically start using? Because they thought that would be the original Edemic language. What, what language would they use? And in that time, all 50 babies died. It just didn't work. Because of loneliness, isolation, less, lack of connection, okay? So we often wonder, what is the original language? We call it generally the Edemic language. We have no idea. There are big proponents 
The three big proponents are, some say it's Hebrew, a lot of people argue for that, including um, Dante from Dante's Inferno, and then you got Aramaic, and then some people say it's the language of tongues that people speak. Some people say that God, uh, that Adam invented it, because God said to Adam, you name the animals, and then God stood back and said, I wonder what he's going to, what word's going to come out of his mouth? I mean, we don't know. Maybe that happened, maybe not, right? Some say it was used by Seth's line only, and Ham and Japheth didn't have it, and it was passed down to Abraham, Hebrew, we don't know. We don't know. I do know that we have 7,139 known languages today, and I can barely speak one of them. <laughs> I can't spell any of it within him, right? I struggle with that. The top spoken languages are English, Mandarin, Spanish, French, Arabic, Arabic Russian, and Portuguese. Will we have one common language in heaven? It's, I don't know. It seems like that will be helpful. But also Revelation says God will be worshipped from every tribe, tongue, and nation. I don't know if that means we'll worship in those languages or that's just representative. It would be fascinating to find out. I don't know. I do know that sometimes in this world, one language is very handy, is it not? But yet... There's complications, as you'll see. Now, look at this. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Okay, this word, you probably don't think that's important, but it's an important word. They're moving eastward. In the Bible, to move eastward, that's that way in our room, is to move further away from God. It's also this metaphor. The further east you go, the further you away you go from God. Now, I'm dating myself, but anybody remember Michael W. Smith? Is he still alive? I don't know. Okay, all right, he's probably still touring, right? He wrote a song called Go West, Young Man. Anybody know that one? Go West, Young Man, When the Evil Goes East. This is the theme of the Bible. That's where that comes from. Uh, I never will forget the second grade. I was learning to read in school, still struggling to learn to read English, right? But anyway, so I remember the teacher saying on a piece of paper, if you're writing like geography and you're trying to figure this out, like which way is north, south, east, and you know, what, what, she said, always remember that we read, read, to the east. So she says, you know, as you read, and she, she would hit the word E, that's east. That's how I know how east is, right? Second grade teachers, you're awesome, right? That's what I remember. But in the Bible, it started with a Adam. Adam is expelled from the garden, and he says he moved east. Cain then is cursed and banished, and he chooses to go further east, right? And, and now Ham is going further east. It's not just geographic. It is moving away from God in the Bible. For Israel, when they're wandering in the desert, God had them set the tabernacle up so that the entrance of the tabernacle actually faced east so that when you enter the tabernacle, you were headed west. Kind of the metaphor happening here in the Bible. When Abraham and Lot have a disagreement, which we'll see in a couple of weeks, they decided to separate. And Abraham tells Lot, go anywhere you want. Lot sins, goes east. This is happening in the Bible. The Israelites, when they were exiled to Babylon, they go to the east, right? The wise men who see the star, they're in the wheat east, and they come west to find Jesus. See, this is happening all throughout Scripture. And when Jesus came in on Palm Sunday, he came from the east, so he's traveling west, you know? And they say, uh, there's debate about this one, but uh, most cemeteries, they know what they're doing. They bury you so that your head is to the west and your feet are to the east. So that the idea is when Jesus returns, you sit up and you're facing the east because Jesus is coming from the east where he's just destroyed and dealt with all sin. Okay? So this is all like, this is not a, just a throwaway word. They're getting farther and farther from God. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. Okay? Shinar, that's in modern day Iraq. So you got the location. You got it there. Let's see what happens. All right. Now, next slide. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks, bake them thoroughly. And they use bricks instead of tar and mortar. They're advancing in technology, and these last for a long time, thousands and thousands of years. They want to make something that will last forever so people will remember them and know them. Technological progress doesn't always mean moral progress, okay? Next, next verse, it goes on. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city, Babylon, with a tower, there it is, that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. All right, they're going to commit, they commit four sins in this verse. Let me show you what they are. Four sins. Number one, they want to build a city to themselves. Let's build a city to ourselves. We use all the materials that last forever so everybody knows our name. 
our image, who we are. First sin. Second sin, they made a tower to reach the heavens. Again, we were going to get so high that if God wants to flood again, he's not going to get us. Can't reach me. We're going to get way up there. We're going to get to the heavens. Third, they aim to make their name great. We want to make a name for ourselves, with our city, with our reputation, forever. Our name, okay? Whatever we're at. And then we don't want to scatter. We want to cluster. We don't want to do what God says. We want to be right here in this unholy environment. They simply wanted to make a name for themselves, a city for themselves, eradicate God, get as far eastward as God, say, we, this is us, you stay over there, we don't need you anymore, we're going to do our thing, we're who we are, our kingdom, our counterfeit kingdom. Now look at all the personal language in this verse too that they say. They said, come, let us, we got the word us, we got ourselves, we've got uh, we, we got ourselves, you know, we got we. You see the language there, they're leaving God out. They're doing the exact opposite that God did in creation when God says, let us make man in our image. And they're saying, no, we're going to make ourselves in our image, in our likeness. It still happens Today, that people don't want to be made in the image and likeness of God. They recreate themselves, redefine their gender, redefine themselves, redefine cultures to say, we're going to make ourselves in our image. It's demonic. It has been from the beginning. It's happening right here. All right, next. Then it says, next slide. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of God were building. Okay, this is, this is interesting, right? Um, it's as if, it's as if um, it was so small that God couldn't see it from heaven. Actually, let me back up to that last verse. There's some stuff I think I just want to share. Um, disciples oh, don't aim for fame. They're trying to make themselves great. Our name, our image, our likeness. Disciples aren't trying to make themselves famous. Is it a sin to seek to be famous? Yes. Yes. It is a sin to make your name great. Now, there's nothing wrong with having influence if God puts that on you. But this societal idea of trying to be famous, to be famous for being famous, is recurring of what they did in Babylon. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's a sin to want glory. As a Christian, we want Jesus to get the glory. Don't do what you do to get glory and fame. Do it for the reward of heaven. Okay? That's what we, that's what we want to do. Okay? Your aim is to bring fame to his name. That's kind of the point, okay? And I want you in your life to seek to be faithful over famous. In a world that's telling you, oh, we should be famous. You can have a platform. You can have followers. You can have likes. You can be Insta-famous. You can be TikTok-famous. It is thick these days. You can make a name for yourselves. You can make a, a lasting impression for your name, just to back the Babylonians. Seek to be faithful over famous. Then the Lord comes down to see this, and it's almost like God's looking down and go, oh, what are they building down there? Let me go check this out, this little bitty tower that they got, you know. It's what he's doing. It's like Moses is kind of making fun of what's happening here, okay. Now, we don't know where it's at. We don't know. Some people say this is it, the Borisipa ziggurat, okay. A ziggurat is where you go hide, look at the stars and astrology and that sort of thing, okay. Now, maybe that's it. Maybe it's not. This is over in Babylon. Let me see the size of the truck here. So it's not really made it very far, right. Nebuchadnezzar also is going to build a big tower in the book of Daniel. We read about that. And it's interesting. He says, I'm going to see what the children of man have built. In other words, all of these people who are far from me, let me see what they built. If you build apart from God, you're not building as a child of God. Build what you build as a part of who God is. Then the Lord said, next slide. Then the Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Okay? God was not feeling threatened by their collective ingenuity. He's not like, oh, I'm scared. Like if they come together, oh, they'll take over the kingdom. He's, he's, not, he's not scared of that at all. God loves us. He knows your name. He loves you. And he knows that sin would ruin his children if pride, human pride, was allowed to progress unimpeded. So look at this language. It repeats. Said, God says, come let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. God's answer to Hamas, sin, violence, was the flood. God's answer to this sin is confusing languages. 
God also always has an answer that's redemptive in nature. In verse 5, the Babylonians say, come let us build a city. And God says, oh yeah? Well, come let us confuse your languages. This is his response, right? God's response to the arrogance of man was to make it harder for man to communicate and thus unite in God belittling global plans. Thousands of languages around the world and thousands of different people limit global aspirations of the arrogance of mankind. So God then scatters them all over the earth and they stop building the city. That's why it was called Babel. Somebody asked that question. Is this why we, where we get the word babbling? That's exactly where we get the word babbling. When somebody babbles, when a baby's just laying in the crib, babbling, babbling, babbling. When the IRS talks, it's just babbling. We got, <laughs> it's, called, it's called the babbleize. To, the babbleize is to take something very complicated and not explain it very well. <laughs> That's what that is, right? So th- this is what's happening. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face, over the whole earth. And uh, Zach, come on up and get ready, if you would. We're going to close in just a second here. He, God scattered them. That, that word's more. He scattered them. In other words, God says, I'm go- my will is going to happen. I told you from the very beginning, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. If you don't want to make it happen, I'll make it happen. That's, God does that. And I promise you, in your life, God has a will. And it will come to pass. You can either be a part of it or not. And I encourage you to be a part of it of what God is doing, because it will happen. And that's where we get the word babbling. Now I'm going to close with this. Zach, go ahead and get ready. Zach, there you go. All right. I'm going to close with um, this idea. Like, okay, mm, mm, let me say it this way. What in the world are we supposed to do with all this? What are we, how are we supposed to respond to all of this? What do we do with this information? I think there's a great verse in Matthew that kind of sums this up, how it lands in your life. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who, humble, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The, the idea here is pride. What sin keeps you from apologizing? What sin keeps you from asking for help? What sin causes you to cheat or lie? What sin makes you have the last word? What sin makes you want to build a thing for your name? What sin makes you want to take the glory from God? Pride. Pride. That's what we're talking about here. The sin of pride. But maybe it's no mistake that in our language, I is right in the center. And that's what pride is, putting ourselves, I, right in the center. This is the original sin. This is the original sin. The original sin actually wasn't with Adam and Eve eating the fruit. The original sin happened before that with Satan saying, I want the kingdom. I want what you got, God. I'm going to take it from you. I'm going to build a counterfeit one. It was his pride to think he would have something that he didn't deserve. Pride's a problem. I encourage you. I had more notes here, but I'm just going to jump to the end here. God hates pride, and so should you. God hates pride, and so should you. God doesn't hate you. He hates the pride in us. He, hates the, he didn't hate the Babylonians. He actually doesn't hate the Hamas. He hates the pride in them. He hates the spirit of pride that is prevalent in those who are far from God, moving eastward from God, because it keeps you from coming to him and relying on him. Pride makes you continue to move eastward. He opposes the proud, it says. Whenever you're prideful, you're picking a fight with God. That's what, that's what they were doing. That's what uh, Nimrod was doing. That's what the Babylonians were doing. They didn't even know it. They were picking a fight with God, and you cannot win that. If you fight against God and you win, you lose. You want God's plan. The the remedy for pride is humbling yourselves, humility. I promise you, what what happened with the Babylonians, what happened to all of us, they would not humble themselves, so God did it for them. God humiliated them. And made them low. And they wanted to go high. God made them low and wide. The opposite of what they wanted to. God will do the same thing with us. If all we're about is I and what I want and my name and my thing and my whatever. And we leave God out of it. We're going farther and farther away from God and more to ourselves. There will be a humbling. That's just the way it goes. My challenge to you today is to unfollow pride and follow Jesus. Let's build our life on him. Let's stand and we're going to sing just... Super quick, a closing song, and then we'll pray and be done for the day.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we come before you humble, giving you praise and glory for for all that you are and all that you've done and the ways that you love us, Jesus. As we look at the story of Babel and how it's not just a story about one person at one time or one nation, but it's the story about what we oftentimes always do. We try to build our own kingdoms, do our own things, live our own ways. And oftentimes it leaves us wanting more. So Jesus, today, as a people, as a church, we turn our face to you. We ask that you would help us to give you the glory, to give you the honor, to exalt you high, because when we do that, that's when we truly find life. So Jesus, today, as we go out into the world, and we go out to live for you, Jesus. I just ask that everything that we say, everything that we do, we would seek to lift your name high, to share the love that you've shared with us, with everyone we come in contact with. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the way it shapes and guides us. Go before us and make a way. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Have a great week.